Hi, everybody. So my name is Rob Bird. I'm a platform architect for Akamai Technologies. And for those that don't know who Akamai is, we're the world's largest CDN. Um, so you may be wondering, why is a guy that specializes in HTTP and delivery telling you that HTTP is not the thing to use for IoT? Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about MQTT today, which is a protocol that you may run across if you're working in IoT. And basically, MQTT is a featherweight uh, ISO compliant pub sub messaging protocol. Um, it's specifically designed for the Internet of Things, but it was actually developed in the late 90s by IBM and some oil and gas folks. And what's interesting about MQTT is that it bakes pub sub messaging directly into a protocol that you can use on devices that don't have a lot of RAM or a lot of resources. So if you're not, fam if you're not, if you're not familiar with pub sub messaging, what is it exactly? Well, basically, it's a way for publishers and subscribers to talk to each other without having to know each other's addresses or specific details like their ports. And so the way it works in MQTT is it's actually based on what we call topic-based PubSub, which basically means I have a topic here. So for example, I have my example topic, and I've got a set of subscribers that have told my message broker, who's my central server, um, that they're interested in anything that comes on that topic. And so basically, whenever a message is sent to example, they'll automatically receive it. So what does pub sub messaging really do for you in the long run? Basically, it does three things. It decouples you in space, time, and synchronization. And what this really means is publishers and subscribers don't have to know each other's details. They don't have to know their IP addresses and their ports. Um, they don't have to be online or active uh, at the same time. So you can have a device that's temporarily offline. Say you have a connected vehicle that's gone through a tunnel, uh, but you've sent a message to that vehicle. Like there's, say that there's a new uh, weather alert that, that you want to send to that vehicle. And when it comes out of the tunnel, it'll automatically receive the message that it would have received if it was online at that point in time. And it also means that the sender and the receivers don't all have to work at the same speed, meaning that uh, the publisher can publish as fast as he wants, and the subscribers can receive the data as fast as they can consume it. And you can also apply some rate limiting and other techniques to scale the reception on each side. So let's just go over a couple of the basics of MQTT. You know, first and foremost, it's a very lightweight protocol itself. It really can't get much simpler than MQTT in practice. It's a tiny little eight-byte header, and the rest is just payload. And the payload is effectively arbitrary. Um, it's specifically really designed for low-power devices and things that may only be running on battery. It's what they call PRAM consistent, which basically means that it guarantees ordering per publisher as each message is actually sent. And that's maintained across even a distributed set of brokers. So if you have a large network of brokers with millions of devices connecting into those brokers, it can maintain the ordering of all of those different things without a, a necessary um, uh, direct attachment to the transport layer. It does support multiple transports, TLS, TCP, and WebSockets. And in the upcoming version of MQTT5, there's going to be another set of transports included in that. It's pretty flexible. It'll support pretty large message sizes, up to 256 megabytes in size. And interestingly enough, the topics themselves can be used as implicit key value storage. So it's a great way to store some state that you want things to be able to read. It's a really clever way to be able to uh, kind of layer an API on top of the infrastructure. And it's also nice because uh, the devices that subscribe to those topics can then receive automatic updates to those key values. So if you have something that you want to monitor, say, what's the current temperature that I desire for this, uh, this thermostat. I can stay subscribed to the current temperature topic, and whenever changes are made to that, uh, to that element, they'll automatically be pushed to all the subscribers. It also has something called quality of service built into it, which is really a delivery guarantee that MQTT provides. And this lets you basically uh, determine the seriousness or the quality of, of which the delivery is actually made. So QoS zero is the most basic level. This is basically a fire and forget message. And if the device is online to receive it, it'll receive it if it can be delivered. If it can't, it's going to be thrown away. QoS one and QoS two are both effectively guaranteed delivery with the difference that QoS two actually uses effectively a two phase commit for the uh, transmission guaranteeing exactly once delivery. Now, there's some contention about can you actually have exactly once, technically speaking. The truth of the matter is, is this is only at the protocol level. So it can give you that guarantee end-to-end -end at the protocol level, but not within the stacks on, on each side of that connection. 
It supports something called a persistent session. And what's neat about MQTT in particular, like I mentioned before, is that it's really designed for intermittent connectivity, which means that sessions are designed to last for weeks or months or technically in, indefinitely. In fact, I've heard of sessions lasting years. Um, it uses automatic keep alive messages during that time period in conjunction with timeouts. And so basically what this means is that if you send a message at at least QoS one or two, that message will be queued for delivery when the device eventually regains connectivity. So what's nice about this again is that it acts implicitly as a queuing system baked into the push base system. It also supports something called a last will and testament message. Now this is kind of neat. This is basically a message that's registered uh, with the broker when you first subscribe. And what you're telling that broker is if you lose my session, not just my connection, but my session, send this particular message to uh, this particular topic. And that can be a number of different things. You can send that message to a specific person. You can have it be a retained message, like a piece of state. And so for example, I may want to uh, know if a device is online or offline at any given time. And one way that you can use the last will and testament message explicitly is to provide you with this kind of state update um, to record changes in that particular state. So for example, here, when I first uh, subscribed, I said, on a normal case, I'm just going to dis disconnect. My last will and testament message is discarded by the broker. And the broker says goodbye, and everything moves, moves on. However, if I lose my session, it will forward that to all the subscribers. So you can imagine, for example, if you have a, uh, like a buddy list, um, which is a very common use case of MQTT. For those that, that do not know, uh, the largest MQTT application in the world is actually Facebook Messenger. And so all the presence for all the people that are online or offline is basically recorded in a set of uh, these last will and testament messages that are automatically issued when, you've, when you disconnect ungracefully. It also supports a retained message, and this is what I was mentioning before about using it as a key value store for all intents and purposes. And basically what this is is a single message per topic that is distributed automatically when someone subscribes to a topic for the first time. And if you stay subscribed to the message, uh, to the topic rather, then any changes to that retained message will be automatically pushed to you with a flag to indicate that that's the retained message that's being changed. Now what's nice about this is, like I said, if you're trying to track state of a specific device over time, this gives you an automatic way to not have to pull for this information on a continuous basis. And this reduces your load on central key value stores and things like that. Now if we draw a comparison with HTTP, and I think it's important, you know, as someone that comes from the world of HTTP, to, you know, really call these, these things out, there are some pretty important differences. First and foremost, you know, HTTP is really intended for documents. When you think about how it was created, it was explicitly designed to summarize the transport of document content. Whereas MQTT is really focused on tiny messages. Even though it'll support up to 256 megabytes in size, a common use case for MQTT is to simply stream individual values. So for example, I may periodically stream the, the temperature in this room. And all I have to send is that one individual number. I don't have to send framing. I don't have to send um, a whole bunch of other content. So when you think about the purpose of messaging, if you were to use HTTP as a messaging protocol, it's basically very inefficient. Um, it's also not very power efficient. And we have some interesting comparisons coming up here in a minute that'll let us go through that. HTTP also doesn't have this notion of quality of service. And if you're trying to use PubSub messaging as really an underpinning of an application development stack, then quality of service becomes much more important. So for example, if I'm loading a web page, it doesn't really matter what items load first on the page. I may get an image on the left side, I may get an image on the right side. Now clearly there is some optimization there, but it's not critical to the actual execution of that. But if you imagine that we're having a chat and we're exchanging those messages back and forth, you need the messages that I send you to arrive in order. Otherwise, the chat's not going to make any sense. So this is where the quality of service things really start to matter. And when you look at client language support, there's basically the same uh, uh, client libraries and languages that you would expect with HTTP are available with, with MQTT. In particular, the Eclipse project actually maintains pretty much all the reference clients for MQTT under something called the, the PAHO project. So let's take a look at power efficiency. This is a really interesting study done by a guy named Stephen Nicholas, and I would encourage you to check out his website. He's a lot of detail here. And basically what he did was he set up a, a simple 
a messaging application using Comet long polling on HTTP and compared it to uh, sending messages with MQTT. And in particular, he compared both the amount of battery that was used by each individual protocol over 3G and Wi-Fi, as well as the actual message rate. So how many messages did he actually get through efficiently using TCP as transport? And what we see here is that basically in every category, MQTT was more power efficient, in some cases quite significantly, and the message rate itself was significantly higher, both on the sending and the receiving side. Except for this one. <laughs> so here's actually a comparison. Here was his actual data comparison of MQTT versus HTTP's power efficiency. And you can see here that HTTP, while it was quite successful, used significantly more power per message. And people wonder, you know, what, why would it use that much more power per message? Well, it uses that much more power because it has a variable length header. You've got things that you have to parse. You have effectively an ASCII wrapper that you have to uh, that you actually have to process. Whereas MQTT was very efficient and was significantly lower latency in every case. And then on this particular graph here over Wi-Fi, we see the same exact behavior, although interestingly, MQTT used a little more power sometimes, but much of the time it used less power. So why does this really matter when you're building applications? Well, I think it's probably self-explanatory, right? If you have devices that depend on batteries and you're, you're seeking the best long, longevity, and you're also trying to minimize the latency of interactions with that device. So for example, how quickly can I get feedback to a light on my device if I push a button? MQTT will consistently and over time give you significantly superior results. It's also very efficient for doing things like distributing multicasts. So for example, if you wanted to uh, send a message to a thousand clients with HTTP as the, quote, the publisher, you're really gonna send that a thousand times, right? You're not gonna send it one time. And with MQTT, the, the, the pub-sub metaphor basically permits you to have efficient multicast and broadcast at scale without really any limitation on uh, the individual publisher's ability to fan out or even track the state of all the things that might be interested. So, it was pretty quick, right? <laughs> so, do you guys have any questions about MQTT? No, so, and actually H2 is one of the recommended transports uh, for MQTT5. Um, so there's clearly a convergence, and H2 is much more efficient uh, than HTTP. Um, and what I think we're really seeing here is this is, you know, you, you can kind of think of MQTT as, uh, as an application kind of embedded into the protocol, right? Um, there are clearly other queuing protocols like AMQP and XMPP and so forth, but MQTT has this kind of unique combination of features that have been found to be very efficient, particularly for device communications. Um, but to your point, expect there to be significant interest in H2 over time, and expect, uh, we expect people to use H2 as a transport for MQTT in the future as a way to, uh, to, to achieve efficient PubSub. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so it can be distributed very easily, actually, and it, it comes down to basically um, that particular consistency guarantee that's provided for per publisher, that PRAM consistency guarantee. So really, if you think about building a big distributed queue, what you need is for your, say, your key value store to support PRAM consistency. MQTT has a lot of little subtle details in it that make that possible. Um, you know, it's very easy to get that wrong. Uh, one of the particular details is something called session takeover. So for example, if you connect with your ID and then you connect again with another device but with the same ID, the session actually has to transfer literally mid-delivery stream to the second device. Now, if you didn't have that, then the ordering within an individual publisher would be broken um, but what's nice about this is PRAM consistency, you, you, uh, like if you look at the sort of uh, levels of consistency from like linearizability at the very top all the way down to say PRAM consistency at, at the bottom, this is just about the weakest form of consistency that you can have. It's actually weaker than eventual consistency. So you can really build this up on a distributed key value store 
And then on top of that, you have to kind of contend with things like topic ordering across publishers. Now, what's interesting is MQTT doesn't give you any guarantees there. So for example, uh, let's say um, publisher ABC was the way that you read this first sequence of messages. They were all published at the same time. The next time they all publish at the same time, you might get it in a completely different order, right? That's your question? Okay. Great. Uh, anybody else have a question? Uh, what's the nature of the uh, sort of infrastructure that you need to run this? The the thing that's doing the queuing, you know, that that central server. You know, where can it be run? How heavyweight is that? Could that be distributed amongst a group of equally powered clients? I mean, what's the nature of that? Uh, yeah. System? So basically, um, most of the implementations of MQTT have really been either standalone servers. There's so, for example, the reference server, is something called Mosquito. It, it works really as a single server. And it's designed to work with other Mosquito servers, but uh, not in a clustered form. So they don't act as a single kind of logical server. However, uh, there are new uh, innovative ways of building this. So for example, that can live in a data center or at the edge. And you know, Akamai loves the edge. Um, and uh, you can build a single logical service that spans the entire edge network in that way. Excellent. Yeah, let's, uh, anybody else? We got just a bit more time if anybody want to ask another question. Yeah, so Akamai is really focused on, you know, if you go back to our roots, you're really focused on trying to make a single website that was spread out over thousands or, you know, hundreds of thousands of servers look and feel like it was one logical service. And so there's a lot of expertise that kind of goes in that area. And we've recognized MQTT as being a very critical protocol to the future of the Internet of Things. And it, quite frankly, builds off very naturally the technologies that we have for our existing HTTP edge. So we do have some future plans in this area. I can't be too specific at this point, but um, you can probably guess where we're going with this. Oh, anybody else? Anybody else curious about MQTT? <laughs> All right. Well, I guess uh, that we'll, we'll conclude that, and uh, let's give uh, Rob a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thanks.